last exciting episode, we talked about social, social behaviors through computing and aggregate, looking at things like Twitter, looking at affect, looking at the social contagion, emotional contagion experiment done at Facebook and so on. Um, this is kind of more in that same vein. And what we're going to do in particular is talk about uh, how much we can learn from large data sets. And we're going to start to move into talking about how you actually do it. So you, you see here I've got two papers up, the very first one, Predicting the Present by Hal Varian, and the third one, uh, the Hands-On Guide to Google Data. That will start to get into uh, how you can actually access and use this data yourself. Okay, let's get started. Um, so Hal Varian, um, you should know, uh, really well-respected information scientist uh, slash economist. Uh, he's been at Google uh, longer than I have, so he's been here about 15 years. And he's done a huge amount of work with um, understanding how Google queries can tell us what's going on in the world. So in particular, he's been looking at uh, how to predict economic trends with Google query data. So if we've got all this stuff, what can we do with it? What, what can we tell? So um, it's been said before that prediction is really hard, especially when you're trying to predict the future. Um, but there's a lot of data in the world, a lot of time series data, and in particular, large companies like Google, credit card companies, Amazon, and so on. We all have these time series data sets about how people buy things, about how people search for things, uh, what they want to do. Uh, companies like Uber or Lyft have different kinds of data sets. And in particular, what I want to talk about today is the Google Query data set, especially since we can actually look at some of it, and I'll tell you how in a minute. But it's worth remembering what John Battelle said. He, he wrote a, a really well-known book about, about Google search, and he called Google Queries the database of intentions. That is, it, it's the kind of stuff we search for, literally search for, of things we hope, we desire, we want, we, we intend to do in the future. And so mining that information stream can be really productive and interesting. So if you look, uh, actually I have to say, uh, I realized in the syllabus that I put in a link to, to the wrong version of the paper. This is another one of those papers that has multiple incarnations, multiple versions. If you look at the syllabus now, there's one that says the technical version. That's probably the one, one you want to do. If you find this kind of work interesting, you probably want to go read that paper because it gives lots of very specific directions on how to build models. But in this other paper, we have this, um, this idea that if we have different kinds of data, we can say things like, you know, people uh, uh, on Monday go back to their desks and they click on, on advertising on Tuesday and, and Tuesday and Wednesday is when the purchases peak online because they've done their research on Monday. Friday and Saturday, people buy stuff or stuff arrives, and then it's, you keep cycling back and forth. So it's a continuous open loop like that, or a loop that goes on. And in particular, we can actually combine AdWord and Google search data with MasterCard, a product called Spending Pulse, which is a data stream you can get from them, because all of these people cooperate with data sharing. Um, we can see they click on ads on Monday, they buy, not immediately, and they spend the rest of the week sort of thinking about what they're going to do, and then peak actually, uh, you know, getting stuff on Friday and Saturday. So, more generally, if you look at, for example, the yellow curve there, this is in the U.S. searches for home inspections and appraisals. So these are two steps you have to go through whenever you buy a house in, in the U.S. And this is search over the over from 2004 to end of 2010. So. It, you see this up and down, up and down, up and down pattern, right? Um, there's a couple things going on here. Overall, the trend is down. If you did a regression line through that, it'd be down to the left, down. That's a measure of the total economy during that time. Remember, this is kind of a negative growth period, which is why the whole thing is trending down. If you looked at that curve now, say for the past couple years, it'd be going up, right? But this is the time period we're looking at. That's part one. The second signal is you see that constant up and down. So over the course of a year, you see it go up and go down, and go up and go down, 
go up. And so this is, guess what? We call that annual variation. And it turns out that people don't like buying houses in November, December, January, February, because, well, you can imagine why. It's cold and it's nasty and nobody wants to buy a house. But it's springtime now, and so house sales go way up, and so the queries, house inspections and appraisals go way up as well. Now, the thing in green is the actual number of new homes sold. Okay, that's interesting because that's actual gold standard data. That's actual numbers of real recordings of houses sold. And you can see those two curves really map together in their shape, right? The overall volume is different, but we'll get to that. I mean, you see, it, it, it's called a lagging indicator because it's lagging behind the actual sales. And during 2008, 2009, people still thought they could buy a house, but they really couldn't, <laughs> which is what, what the difference is. So you see this kind of uh, shape here that you get these patterns uh, which don't necessarily align with ground truth, but are useful for making predictions. We're going to come to predictions in a second. We'll get back there. This is the same kind of analysis for new homes sold in green versus uh, searches for home insurance. Because if you buy a house, you need to get house insurance. You see, them. again, the blue pattern predicts and aligns with the, the green pattern. Now, I don't know. Have any of you heard of Google Flu Trends? I, I hope so. Um, because what this was, um, it's no longer a service, but once upon a time, we had this product um, Actually, just a, truthfully, the truth is it was two guys who thought they could do this, and they did it, and they put it up, and it worked really well. Uh, so two Googlers figured out that they could actually take a query set and predict the onset of influenza in the U.S. So the CDC data, which is the actual numbers of real cases of flu per day, per year, per week in the U.S., is in yellow, and the prediction is in blue. Now, the cool thing is that uh, the blue line could be computed about a month ahead of the yellow line because they had built a model that is a predictive model based on this accumulated data from Google queries. Okay? Now, uh, so unfortunately, what happened is, now look at the dates here, 2004, 2009. Pretty good alignment. We have really high fit to that data. Now, unfortunately, what happened is around 2010, they sort of uh, stopped taking care of it. They stopped updating it. And so what you're seeing here is, so you see, this is around the time they stopped taking, updating the model. And so it's tracking very nicely, and it starts to break apart a little bit here. And it gets up to the middle of 2012, and it's really wrong. What happened? Right, why is our prediction so bad? So this paper, which actually uh, recognized this name, Laser et al., that's the same guy from the first paper in the last lecture. Same set of people. Anyway, they're now looking at this predictive model using Google queries. And what happened is that around 2012, the model started to vary from the reality. And what happened is, that especially you see down here, see this, it's totally broken. It's completely busted. But remember, again, this is when they started neglecting it. And so if you zoom in really tightly, you can see uh, what's going on here. Basically, the model drifted. So what happens is, as the image down below is trying to portray, there's the reality, and then there's the model mirror image of that reality. And in 2009, they stopped updating it, and, and the reality started changing. Because the way it worked was it had this sort of regular model, the way you think of a mathematical model, that was driven by the data coming from Google queries. And the Google queries that people used for asking questions about flu changed. There were new drugs, there were new ways of talking about symptoms and so on, and so the model drifted. This is a big lesson for all of science, but in particular for big data science. You have to update your models, they have to stay up to date. You can't just uh, load them, create them, and run, expect that they're going to work, especially if they're running off of Google Trends data. Okay, so that's that. Uh, we're going to come back to Google Trends in, in a second, but I want to pa uh, pause that for a second and talk about this, this second paper. 
Uh, diurnal and seasonal mood vary with work, sleep, and daylight. Correct, correct. Wow. Okay. So here's what the real paper is about. What can Twitter tell us about sleep, what people do across the world? So here's the, the actually the very cool research question of this paper, which is, you know, you've got millions of people constantly tweeting, including our president, unfortunately, but whatever. Um, but we can monitor, we can understand what people are doing at night and day. And if we use this sort of affective analysis tool we've seen before, like we saw in We Feel Fine, we can start to understand more about what's influencing affective response over time. So the first question is, does this work? If so, uh, can we characterize different populations, like night owls versus early risers or different countries? Now, that fancy word diurnal basically means, you know, how people change their behavior across the day, between day and night. So, here's what they did, okay? So, these guys used what's called LUC, that L-I-W-C. It's basically a tool. You can go check it out. I think it's freeware. Um, it's used in a lot of different uh, analytical systems now. Uh, linguistic inquiry and word count, pronounced LUC. And it basically, you feed in text like a tweet. And it then gives you an analysis based on fancy word counting across different, 64 different kind of behavioral dimensions. Like, is it positive? Is it negative? Is it, is it just anxiety or anger or whatever? And a little bit like what Sepp Kamvar and Jonathan Harrison did, Harris did, they took a whole bunch of use messages per user, per tweets per user during this period. They had two and a, almost two and a half million people, five million, 500 million tweets. They got a lot of data here. And this is what they found, okay? So now, this is uh, the affect in tweets by day. So what you're seeing here is the one above, it says PA right there, positive affect. So these are the numbers of positive tweets by time of day. And the colors mean the day of the week. So this one at the top, that's Sunday. This one on the bottom, you can probably guess what this is, right? Here's Monday. It's the red one, and the orange one is Tuesday. And Wednesday is way down there, too. So Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, and Monday. So this is the, these three lines on the bottom are the beginning of the week. No surprise there. People are less positive when they go back to work on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And guess what? As you get through the week, it starts to get better and better with time until you get to Sunday, which is the most positive day of the week. Yay. Okay. And the op opposite of that is the negativity. That's what this NA means here on the left. Negativity affect. So it's sort of the opposite of what we just saw. One thing to notice, though, is that people, the variance here goes between 0 0.02, which is very low, and 0 0.023, which is not much. That's not a lot of difference there. Because they have so many millions of tweets, they actually have pretty good confidence intervals. That's what those, those boundaries are. They have good confidence intervals on those numbers. So it's a real effect. But it's this goes from 0.02 to 0.023, so that's like three one-thousandths of variance. Uh, this goes from 0.053 to 0.62, so that's like 0.08, which is it's significantly bigger. Point is, People express, have more differences in their expression of positivity than of negativity. Huh. Who knew? Okay. So this is the same kind of thing, except broken up by region. So you see green is Africa. Uh, these are all, uh, all the time zone differences are all fixed up. So don't worry about Africa being a different time zone than the U.S. But uh, you can see here that Africa in green kind of flatter, uh, it's about the same. But you see there's a, a huge amount of variance here in India, a huge amount of variance in Africa, less variance in the UK and Australia, and less variance overall than the US. Huh. We'll come back to why this might be so here in a little bit. Again, this is positive affect and this is negative affect. I would bet that this has to do with the number of hours in the day and depending on where you are and what, for example, India is giant, right? 
different times of day. So what they did was this really nice analysis that put a regression model, a regression line, through all the different, um, in the top one here is the positive affect in the tweets. And you can see there's this nice little rise. This, this x-axis is the day length. That is how many hours or minutes of daylight do you get per day. And the longer the day, the more positive tweets you get. The shorter the day, the fewer positive tweets you get. And it's not a huge variation. That's pretty small. But compare it to the negative ones, which is basically flat. Okay? There's basically not a signal here. This is as close to a flat line as you're going to get. So here's the results of their work. First, the affect is almost consistent across days. You know, it had that curve we saw earlier is the same shape if it's Monday or Sunday. <clears throat> it's almost always the same. <clears throat> On the other hand, if you look just at the positivity in tweets, it peaks in the morning and and near midnight. Whereas negativity it peaks at 3 a.m. And, and 9 p.m. So it's kind of almost not quite the reciprocal, but it's pretty close. So they have different, very different sort of uh, patterns. Hence the diurnal. That's what the diurnal refers to, is the change throughout the day. Negativity is lowest in the morning. Right? So the day, that makes sense. And as we just saw, there's no effect of daylight except for the positivity. Slightly more positive associated with longer days. And but it's not true for negativity. As the days get shorter, you, the negativity chart does not change at all. Now, now. Let me tell you about natural experiments. Natural experiment is when you discover that you can subdivide your data into different groups that allows you to do differential analysis. So for example, in the United Arab Emirates, the work week, since it's an Islamic country, the work week runs from Sunday to Thursday. Okay? <clears throat> so if the diurnal rhythms are affected by sleep schedules, we would expect the UAE to have a different response curve than, say, Western Europe, which runs Monday to Friday, right? So it's easy. It's a natural experiment because we have two different natural conditions happening. We can separate out the data, and we can just look at the United Arab Emirates versus the U.S. Uh, versus uh, Western Europe, say. And yes, it turns out, yes, the peaks are shifted by one day exactly as you'd expect. So basically, if you break the user, the UAE out of the entire data set, those curves we saw, they just get bigger. The, the error, bar goes, our error bars go down because the, all that data is shifted by 24 hours. So you take it out, the error bars reduce because all of a sudden the error is different, which is a fantastic result. I did not expect that. And on the other hand, it is true that we get to run these natural experiments all the time, usually having to do with language groups, like German speakers versus, say, Spanish speakers versus, you know, people in South America versus people, say, in, in China. <clears throat> now, a, a problem, I, th this is just for you if you want to read it, um, but basically a, a, an issue with all these studies is that they don't really represent the universe as a whole or at least the, the, the Earth universe as a whole, it's not statistically representative of everybody or any particular country. It's broad. And in particular, it's people who use Twitter tend to be technophilic. They love technology. They tend to be you know, higher income, more connected, more digitally, high, higher bandwidth, and so on and so on. So there is this bias. Big tip. Every study is biased. And you just have to recognize what that is. Okay, okay so in the last 15 minutes or so, I want to give you a little bit uh, of guidance about how to use Google Trends to, for example, potentially do your data analysis project. Uh, so Google Trends, as I said, is basically the aggregated data from uh, Google Query data. But what's nice about it is you can slice it and dice it and download it in various ways. So this is a really easy thing for, for someone to do uh, if you're looking for kind of social aggregated behaviors. Now, I'm not going to tell you what to search for, but I'm just saying 
this is a way to do it. And we'll, we're going to talk next week, next time, about other ways to do your project, but this is one that's particularly easy. So Google Trends is a tool you can search for. Just search for it in Google, right? Google Trends. And it allows you to search, look for how people search for particular search terms. So here, what I've done is I've entered in two terms, in flu and the search term influenza. Okay. So what you see here is the chart of the number of queries made over the past, say, what is this, uh, 10 years, from 2005 to 2015. And you can see the red line is influenza. Right? See that? Red is influenza. Blue is flu. What this tells me is that the term influenza is not used a whole lot as a search term. Right? What this allows me to do is understand, if, for example, if I added the word grippe, G-R-I-P-P-E, the, the French term for flu, right? I would then see French searches for flu because obviously they're not going to search for influenza, right? So you can do this kind of dissection and get into understanding what people are trying to do. Using Google Trends data, you can also get into the data by slicing by different properties. So I can, I can have different kinds of regional interests. So here I've done uh, flu versus influenza. And up here, you see, uh, this is showing you flu by region. And this one below is showing you influenza by region. So look at this. The term flu is used in the United States, Canada, Australia, English parts speaking parts of the world, India, South Africa, UK. The word influenza is used pr primarily in Italy. I guess that's Denmark. I can't see. I could zoom in on, online. Uh, Chile, Mexico, Cuba, and so on. There's a, there's a natural distinction here. I guess it says right there. Mexico, Cuba, Puerto, Puerto Rico, Italy, Denmark. Okay. I didn't ask for a language distinction, but it gave me one. I didn't realize that that was true. And you can slice and dice this in many different ways. So um, if you click on related searches, you can actually start to see other searches that go along with the searches I asked about flu and influenza, right? So for example, at the time, swine flu was a big concern, and so you would see lots of uh, swine flu um, queries. And here I actually did flu versus influenza versus grip. And you can see, obviously, <clears throat> if we click on grip, we're going to see it in France, we're going to see it in Switzerland, we're going to see it in Haiti. That makes sense, right? Okay. So in, in some sense, that's just confirming what we already knew about the uh, uh, Francophilic uh, countries. But you can also start to see aggregate behaviors of people in the large. So here, for example, I did a, a search comparing four terms. And this is, in some sense, uh, me asking the question, what is America's pastime? Because if you if lived in the United States, you probably heard this, this term, this phrase before, baseball, America's pastime. Well, if you look at this chart, red is football, green is baseball. I'm sorry, baseball fans. Baseball is not America's pastime. It's clearly football. Now, this is in terms of total queries query volume over this period, but it's not even close, right? Uh, it's also very, very consistent. Uh, the, the yellow thing here, basketball, I will tell you, since it's March, this, is, this peaks in March right here, every March, because in the United States, every March, there's a thing called March Madness, which is the finals for the collegiate basketball teams playing, and it's a big deal in the United States. So everybody's watching basketball all the time this week. But it still does not begin to compete with football. So if you want to do something like this, you can actually start to explore topics, regional interests. You can dissect by fairly finely. So here uh, I could dissect, uh, <coughs> slice and dice by uh, the term football by state. So you can see uh, Alabama is a big football state. That completely is completely consistent with everything I know about Alabama. Completely consistent with everything I know about Nebraska and Mississippi and so on. Uh, if we switch to basketball, you'd see a different ordering of states. As the, so who knew 
that there were actually extreme regional differences within the United States about sport preference that there are. So as part of your exploration, realize that you can filter by country, you can filter by time, by year, by, by past seven days, and so on. You can also filter by category. So these are large uh, sort of topical areas. So here um, uh, we can, if you click on that twisty, you can actually dive into different pieces within arts and entertainment. For example, there's one just on movies and cinema. Uh, you can dive into any particular thing. You can also do searches by these different kinds of uh, mode searches we have, like a YouTube search or image search. So an interesting, uh, I'm throwing this out as an idea. Uh, you might explore Google Trends data for YouTube searches for different regions or different you know, language groups or something like that. Notice that one of the things you can do, the reason I'm going to all this trouble, is you can download the data. So you can click on that icon and you can download the CSV. You can then choose your language. Um, and if you want to, you can actually get... Uh, you can actually subscribe to updates about these things. Whenever a noteworthy event happens, you can get the da uh, Google Trends data sent to you at that point. Or if you're really interested, you can you know, see that chart on the right? If you click on this funky little uh, bracket slash bracket icon, that will give you this pop-up, which is this is now the HTML you can cut and paste and put it onto your own web page. And you can obviously change the, the W and the H uh, tags to be whatever you want them to be. But then that becomes live, and it's now uh, Google's problem to keep your that fraction of your web page widget up to date and running. One real use of this is to find outliers of various forms. So uh, this was an interesting example I ran across when I was doing a, a study for somebody. Uh, about where are surgical instruments being produced and used and all that. So I did, you can see the, uh, the search query in Google Trends is surgical instrument. You see that? And this, 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 this line is like the most boring line ever. There's basically a lot of noise. Nothing going on there. But when you look at the regional interest, see that? It shows that Pakistan is, has four times more queries for that phrase, surgical instrument, than the United States. But what is going on? Why is Pakistan searching in English for a surgical instrument? So I did the obvious thing. I started drilling down. <clears throat> I started to search within this region. Uh, what's going on? Oh, look at this. So Punjab, huh. And then I searched on related, I, I clicked on related searches. And you can see surgical instrument importers. There's a company name. Surgical Instruments, Germany, Pakistan, so on and so on. Ah, you see what's going on? Over here on the right-hand side, we have these rising queries. So for some reason, dental instrument, dental surgical, importer surgical, and countries that import these kinds of things. This is a real business for this part of Pakistan. Who knew, right? So clearly there are companies there, and it's not hard to find them whose major business is creating, importing, and exporting uh, surgical instruments, especially dental instruments. There's one other tool I'll tell you about, and this is for people who are really interested in building models, and that's Google Correlate. So uh, just search for it, you'll find it. Uh, it's the basically the flip side of Google Trends. Google Trends is a, is a way to look at the queries by volume for a particular term or phrase, right? Google Correlate allows you to search for a trend, uh, a term, and see the trend line, or, and this is the cool part, you could upload a data set of your own and to see then which terms correlate with that pattern, okay? So this allows you to generate models. You can now start to explore different search terms, look at the pattern there, Extra download the data, extract, start building a model, futz with it for a while, and then re-upload it and validate that that model is actually consistent with what you think. That's how the guys who did Google Flu Trends did their work. They developed a model by testing out all these different search terms, 
downloading the data and building a sort of aggregated model. So what I'm searching for here is the search term skiing. And what's fascinating about this is you see this pattern here? This is exactly what you think. Every winter, <clears throat> hint, in the northern hemisphere, um, every winter you get this big spike, right? See that? Right around uh, Christmas, into December, so on. Okay, cool. Now, what you can do with this is to, you can start to manipulate the model. So in this case, I shifted it by half a year, by 25 weeks. And I said, what, I, I shifted the, 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 the query model for skiing by 25 weeks. And guess which search terms are correlated with that pattern? Col this is in the US. Colorado camping, canoe, whitewater rafting, just what you think. Summertime activities, right? Not a big surprise. But I'm showing this to you as an example of the kind of analysis you can do by comparing one data set and its model with queries and their query volumes using Google Correlate. Okay? You can also take that, that same data and map it in different ways. In this case, uh, uh, so here I'm just looking at a average latitude uh, as a query term and discovering which states have which kind of queries. And so, um, unsurprisingly, in retrospect, the northern states you see up here, like Washington, Alaska, which is, is totally maxed out, uh, and all these northern states, do the query how much vitamin D, heated seats, seasonal affective disorder, and so on. Okay, These are all related to this query about average latitude. So I'm showing this to you because you can do the same kind of thing worldwide, and you can start to discover patterns in social behavior only through this mechanism of the aggregated search terms. Okay, so other than Google Trends, um, our, our Google and now Microsoft and everybody else uh, basically don't share data. And the reason is, uh, the story that goes here, and I intentionally left this page blank because I'm willing to tell it to you, uh, but it's a slightly complicated story, but I'll, I'll take two minutes and tell you about it. So once upon a time, about, uh, about 10 years ago, um, AOL had an active, the, the, the company, had an active research group. And they at the time were a big uh, search engine. So they wanted to sort of spark people learning about, actually, I'll tell you what, Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to this. Um, I'm, I'm going to stop sharing for a second just so I can see you. Um, what we did, uh, what AOL did, not me, <clears throat> was to uh, uh, try to generate some interest in people using their search data to do kinds of analysis like what we're talking about. And so they took a, a query, vol query data set of around 100,000, 150,000 queries, timestamp, unique ID, and they anonymized it. They thought they anonymized it. And, and what happened was they released it, and within a couple of weeks, people had figured out the identities, that is the names, the phone numbers, the email addresses of a lot of the people in the anonymized data set. So this only has to happen to an industry a couple of times before they figure out that sharing data like that is just basically impossible. So it's one of these cases where anonymizing data is really, really, really hard. In fact, uh, several data sets that have been made public, for example, a large data set of DNA sequence data, was, have been retracted from public use because it's, someone discovered, for example, that anonymized DNA data, you can reverse it and figure out actually who the people are, even though it was quite anonymized. And so I think the moral of the story there is that anonymizing data for social computing research purposes is basically impossible. And you know, if you if you create a data set like that, it's you share it at your peril. And so it's kind of a, a, a kind of the flip side of the Facebook emotional contagion study. They very specifically went to a lot of trouble to not release any personally identifying information. 
condition, any PII. This is true for the AOL dataset and it failed. So that's an interesting sort of uh, sort of story because uh, it it suggests that one of the big concerns about all social computing research is the need to be aware of things like informed consent, uh, or be aware about personally identifying information, releasing that data to the world, and so on. It's complicated, but if it were simple, anyone could do it. That's why you're here. Okay, so let me, let me flip back to my slides here for a second. Um, Full screen, full screen, go back to that. Um, so uh, we're going to meet again in two weeks. Yeah, we'll meet again in two weeks. Um, so this is the schedule for April 7th. Uh, we've got a lot of papers to do here. Um, you see I put the practicum right there. I mean, this is, uh, I think what I will actually do is move this into the second hour. So the reason I'm bringing this up is because um, you're supposed to propose a social computing data analysis project. Um, I think the best way to do that is we'll do that by email uh, before the end of that week. So we have several weeks to work on this. So like with the first, the first project was fairly fast, very quick turnaround. This is a little bit more complicated. It's not impossible. It's not even super hard. It's just you need to think about it a little bit. So when we talk next time, <clears throat> we'll actually do a couple of, we'll go through how to find data sets and what you can, what kinds of things you can do with it. Uh, I don't require that you learn any social network analysis package or that you, you know, come up with data R or SPSS or anything, but uh, there's something you can do right now that would allow you to, uh, to be uh, uh, really good with the project. So that's coming up next week, uh, next time we meet. Um, the other thing, yeah, so let's go back here. Uh, I also put in this link to potential data sets. So this is the kind of thing you might want to take a glance at before we meet next time. Uh, this is a bunch of different kinds of data sets. Uh, oh, here we go. Yeah, there's a bunch here. So there's a bunch of, if you want to go redo some of those Facebook analysis, you can do it that way. Um, this actually is Stanford uh, data set. This is actually a bunch of different data sets. So I've given you several terabytes of data here, um, all of which are possible uh, project uh, data sets where you work at. And so just take a look through this and see, see what's interesting. All right. We have a couple, couple minutes left. Uh, are there any questions or, or comments? Also, while you're thinking, um, remember uh, the, the link to the reflections document is in the, the syllabus. So if you have th something you think about tonight or tomorrow, so go ahead and add it in there or email me directly. Um, I'm reading email every day and I will see your message. If I don't respond in 24 hours, send, me, send it to me again and bring it, bring it up to the top. Any questions for anybody? You're all happy and contented? Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. All right. Then I will see you in in a couple of weeks. Then. All right. All right. Cheers.